Let's pray together, shall we? Hallelujah, Lord. Father, tonight as we deal with evangelism, Father, I just ask that you will remind us of our own responsibility. That, Father, when we get the opportunity, we are to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to tell this, the people of this world that there is someone who really loves them. There's someone who really cares and someone who doesn't just love and care but has done something about it and has died for the sins, not just of one or two, but for the sins of the whole world on the cross of Calvary. And that that one could not be kept down by sin, nor by the devil, nor by death, but he rose to the surface again, hallelujah, and he overcame death in one stroke and defeated all enemies so that the devil is now under his feet Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this good news which we have received, we may never take for granted, but that we might be willing to share with all who will listen. Father, we long to see many people saved in this area. And we just ask, Lord, in the things that we study tonight, that we should realize that we live in days of grace, days of grace which are rapidly coming to an end, and that our duty is to pluck as many brands from the fire as possible. Father, we know the days are short, we know we have no time to spend wastefully. We have no time to spend in sin. For our Lord is coming back. Hallelujah. And Father, I just pray tonight we might be challenged in our hearts to serve you with more than we've ever given you before. Hallelujah. That we might know that indeed you are delighted with, what, with our testimony and what we are doing. Father, will you preserve us from what has happened to so many groups. They have the name of being alive, but they are dead. Father, in Jesus' name, will you bless us tonight and by your Spirit, will you teach us wonderful truth in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Last time, we talked about the Jews in the Tribulation and specifically those Jews who will be in the land during the period we call the Tribulation. Now, Tonight, we're not leaving the Jews, but actually, we're going to talk about evangelism in the tribulation, and we're going to see the role that the Jews take in that evangelism. Do you remember last time, we did see some basic principles of evangelism. Do you remember I dealt with the big problem of uh, how did God fill the spiritual vacuum that was created in the land of Israel when all the believers obeyed the word of Jesus and fled to the hills? Suddenly we found there were very few believers, if any believers, left in the land, and that God had the, the job of raising up witnesses for himself in the land, which was at that time filled with armies. And we saw how he did it. He just raised up two men, Moses and Elijah. Now that was one small part of evangelism, but tonight we've got to talk about the whole scope of evangelism, not just in Israel, but around the world. Remember, please, God always does have to have a witness. Before the church came to the earth, it, he had raised up a certain nation, the Jewish nation, and it was the Jews who were his witnesses. When Jesus came and when he was rejected, the Jews were then cut off from being his special people, although only for a season. And at the day of Pentecost, do you remember what happened? They were gathered in the upper room and the Holy Ghost fell on them, and it was the beginning, as it were, the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, when the church came in, those who had the job of witnessing to Christ and being the missionary-based actually changed. Now, instead of it being the Jewish nation, it then became the commonwealth of heaven, which we call the church. So there, you have a difference. Now, remember this. In the church of Jesus Christ, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. But they are not Jews or Gentiles. They are one new man, the man Jesus Christ. And any Jew who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is now a part of the church of Jesus Christ. And any Gentile who has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ is part of the church. And Jew and Gentile have joined one body, the body of Jesus. Galatians 3.28 is very clear. There is neither Jew nor Greek... Right? It also says, of course, bond nor slave, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. And it was this group, the Church of Jesus Christ, that's Jew and Gentile, 
who had the job then of witnessing for Christ. And today, this body is still witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the problem we've got, and the problem we're going to deal with tonight is, at the beginning of the tribulation, the church of Jesus Christ is removed from the earth. All the Jews who are in it are removed. All the Gentiles who are in it are removed. And can you see what we get? We get another spiritual vacuum. For at the beginning of the tribulation, which occurs after the rapture of the church, we have the position where all those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have been removed from the earth. So we have an even bigger spiritual vacuum at that point. And our question is tonight, there is a spiritual vacuum. How does God fill that spiritual vacuum? Who does he use and who does he raise up and how does he raise them up? Who does he use to preach in the period we call the tribulation? Now, fortunately, we don't have to look too far. And again, the answer is found in the book of Revelation. So shall we just turn to the book of Revelation and chapter 7? That's where we're going to find out about evangelism. But actually, we're going to begin in Revelation 6, verse 17. In other words, the last verse of Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17. Now, by way of reminder, do you remember that in Revelation 6, we have the judgments that are going to hit the earth during the tribulation. We have what are called the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and we saw how these judgments will come on the earth, and a resume of some of the judgments is given in Revelation 6. And they're so horrific, they're so terrible, they're so awful, that at the end of Revelation 6, a question is asked, and a very, very, very important question indeed. Verse 17 says this, For the great day of his wrath is come. In other words, the tribulation is a period of God's anger on the earth and God's judgment on the earth. And the question is, who shall be able to stand? And that doesn't mean who can live on the earth during that time. That means who can stand for God in those days. Now, the answer to that question found in verse 17 is the subject matter of the whole of Revelation 7. And so let's go through into Revelation 7 and let's take it a few verses at a time. I'm going to read, first of all, Revelation 7, verse 1 and verse 2, and then we'll analyze it. Verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Now let's stop just there. Four corners of the earth simply mean that it's worldwide, right? This is an idiom for the whole of the earth. So these four angels are standing, and the whole of the earth is under their power. And it says this, They were holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. And I'll end it just there, just for a moment. All right? Now, this is right at the beginning of the tribulation. Remember this, that the Bible is clear that the history of the earth is dictated by angelic forces who exist in the atmosphere around the earth. There is a team of angels specifically demonic angels, who are trying to control the affairs of man on this earth. We have reference in Daniel, for example, to the Prince of Persia, who is the angel who is over the land of Persia. In Ephesians 2.2, we hear a description of Satan, and he's called the prince of the power of the air. The air is the atmosphere. The prince of the power, which represents the team of angels who can try and control the affairs of the earth, in the atmosphere. And today, they have been stirring it up on the earth. Now, you remember, when they start stirring it up, God is going to have his will done. And so God sends angels to stop them, you know, and they start moving in on the earth, and God sends an angel down, and there is war going on constantly around the earth, right? There's a war on for Britain. There's a war on for Israel. There's a war on for Italy. And every day, this warfare is going on. 
Now, these four angels that we see here are four angels who, as we've read in verse 2, have power to hurt the earth. These are the angels who have the job of directing the forces of judgment in the tribulation. Here they are. And we see these four angels. They're standing on the four corners of the earth. And look what it says, holding the four winds of earth, of the earth. The word holding there actually doesn't quite mean holding because that that gives you the impression that they're sort of carrying a basket of goods, you know, and they're carrying this basket and they're about to drop them on the earth. That's not what it says. The word holding here means holding back the winds. Holding them back. Now, what are these winds? Right? And then we'll understand the whole verse. Do you remember in the Old Testament, in Daniel specifically, the the whole of the human race is seen as a sea, right? Fallen humanity is represented as a sea. All was unstable, all was changing, all was going this way and going that way. And in Daniel, it talks about uh, a change in history in these terms. And then a wind broke out on the sea. And a wind blew and stirred up the sea so that a nation which was nice and quiet, like the Assyrians or the the Babylonians, would suddenly find themselves all in a ferment and all stirred up. And in the Old Testament it says that a wind, a spirit, went down and stirred them up. Now, here you have four winds of the earth. These are spiritual powers who are there to stir up the affairs ready for the tribulation. You see? And as we see this verse, the tribulation begins not with judgment but with four angels holding back the judgment. So this is a lull on the surface of the earth. Here is a period of extreme quiet. The tribulation doesn't come in with a bang, it goes out with a bang. It comes in ever so quietly indeed. All the spirits of judgment find that instead of being able to rush to the earth when the Holy Spirit is removed in his restraining power, they're being held back by these four angels. Right Now that's what verse 1 says. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And in verse 2, this is why they're holding it back. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried, which means shouted with a loud voice, He cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And he says, hold on a minute. Just hang about, you know, as we might say. Don't move yet. I've got a job to do. And when the angels hear him, they hold it all back. I imagine them pushing against the forces that are ready to hit the earth. And this angel comes and he has what's called the seal of the living God. And it says this. Hurt not the earth, verse 3, neither the sea nor the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So he comes with the seal of the living God and his job is to seal. Now we've got to understand immediately what a seal is all about. In the ancient world, a seal was simply a bit of wax which was hot And they used to have a ring or something like that, and they used to press the ring into the seal, and it used to leave a mark. And as the wax set, that became a seal. You can see one at the bottom of Magna Carta, you know, and it's got King John's seal on the bottom. Now, the word seal in the Bible has a lot of meanings, but there are two that actually uh, are meaningful to us today. A seal represented, first of all, ownership, ownership, and uh, if, if something had your seal on it, it belonged to you, you know, and so you might have a little, on a ring, so you might have a little mark engraved on the inside, and when this ring's been stolen, you can always identify it, you just have a look, and it says, you know, belongs to so-and-so and so-and-so, and you can say, yes, that's definitely my ring, and the seal was used for ownership, right? That's the first thing. The second thing a seal was used for, it always meant security, It always meant security. 
And if a letter arrived and it was sealed, then you knew that no one had opened it. In other words, it had left the person in the same condition that it arrived to you. And uh, a, a box with treasures in would have a seal on it. And as long as the seal wasn't broken, then that was intact, you know. In Daniel, you read of King Darius. Do you remember? Daniel thrown into the lion's den. He moved the stone on top and then he put his seal on it to make sure no one was going to rescue Daniel. And so it meant those two things. First, ownership. And secondly, it meant security. By the way, isn't it wonderful that the Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, we are sealed by the Holy Ghost. That's absolutely thrilling. All believers are sealed. Now, what does that mean for you? First of all, it means you belong to God forever. And when God looks down on you, he sees his mark and he says, yes, they're definitely mine. Satan sees the seal as well. And if we are discerning, we can see the seal on people. You can meet people and you say they're definitely a believer. But the other thing it means is that if God has sealed you, you're going to be delivered. Praise the Lord. And that means you are going to arrive in heaven in perfect condition as God ordained you to arrive there. And the fact we are sealed by the Holy Ghost simply means that we are secure in our salvation and every person who's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore has received the Holy Spirit is actually going to have a day when they arrive in heaven and Father will look at them and say, well, you've arrived okay. Praise God. Right? Those two things. Can you see here, it's the servants of God here, who are sealed, and with the seal of the living God. In other words, these people who live at the beginning of the tribulation, A, belong to the living God, and B, they are going to be protected and secure. And these servants who are anointed here actually manage to get right through the tribulation. They are protected physically, they are protected mentally, and they are protected spiritually. Those three ways right? There's a limited number of them. All right, now it says the seal of the living God. The question is, what, what or who is this seal? Now, it's not actually stated here, but it could be the Holy Spirit. Now, if it is the Holy Spirit here, then we've got to refresh our memories over the role of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember <coughs> that Um, we've covered this before, that the role of the Holy Spirit changes when the tribulation begins. Every person who's in the church today is indwelt for all time by the Holy Spirit. You can never leave, sorry, you can never lose the Holy Spirit. He's always inside of you once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But before the church came in, in other words, before the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not have that particular ministry. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was here on the earth, right? He was active on the earth. People were born again, but he never came and permanently indwelt any person. He occasionally came and indwelt people for a task, but then he would leave again, you see? So all the kings were indwelt as long as they were in fellowship. The prophets were indwelt. Those who built the temple were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The moment their job was finished, the Holy Spirit went. In the tribulation, the Holy Spirit takes up the role that he had before the day of Pentecost. In other words, he is here because he's omnipresent. He is also uh, able to regenerate, that is, make born again people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in those days. But he does not indwell believers as a whole. And secondly, he allows evil to be rampant. He just takes his restraining hands off and says, okay, you want to be evil? I'll let you have all the evil that you want to, want to collect. Right? And it's coming upon you. The exception are these people here. There are only a few people who in the tribulation are sealed and are indwelt by the seal of God if this is the Holy Spirit. But these are locked. They're in their faith. Satan can't touch them. The satanic trinity can't touch them at all. Affairs can't touch them. They're absolutely gods. Now, there they are. All right? And the reason they're sealed is this. They've got a job to do. And their job, as we shall see, is evangelism. All right. Who are they and how many? Well, let's go down. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And when we come to this verse, those of us who take the Bible literally, we're absolutely laughing. Right? This is easy. What does it say? There were 144,000 
thousand. Right? Easy. If it says 144,000, I wonder how many it means. Probably 144,000. Right? And then it says, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. In other words, they're all Jews. If it says they're Jews, they probably are Jews. It's the people who take the Bible allegorically or as picture language that have the problem here. Because then the question is, well, who are they? And you'll find every group who quote the Bible always claim the 144,000 Jews are them. Right? The Seventh-day Adventists did. And they were the Seventh-day Adventists. We are the 144,000. They changed that now because there were more than 144,000 of them. The early Pentecostals said it was them. You see? Isn't it tragic? Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses are marvellously inconsistent as usual. I tell you what they do. They take the 144,000 literally. And then they say the Jews aren't Jews, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. That's nice, isn't it? So they get the best of both worlds. Or is it the worst of both worlds, you see? Absolutely crazy. I often ask them, I say, well, how come you take that literally and you don't take that literally? You know? And of course, they have absolutely no answer to that. And there are some believers today in the Lord Jesus Christ who say, well, there's not 144,000 Jews. It's the church of Jesus Christ. Well, well, well. Well, there are certain problems associated with that. Actually, of course, if it says 144,000 Jews, it's 144,000 Jews. And can you see what God does? The moment the church is removed, the Jews become the missionary base again. It's the Jews. And if we read from verse 5 down to verse 8, we see the composition of these Jews. By the way, if this is the church, do you realize what it means? That every Christian belongs to a tribe in the church. Apparently, the church must be composed of various tribes. You know, apparently that's so. In fact, this passage is so clearly literal, you really have to force it to make it anything else. See, it doesn't just say, of all the tribes of Israel. It then lists the tribes. That's the point, you know. You really do have to work hard at this. I could probably, you know, show you some people who've had to spend whole books explaining this passage away and what it means. If, by the way, if you're a Christian and you know which tribe you're from, do see me afterwards, will you? Because I'm likely to disagree. You're from one tribe, and that's the tribe of Judah, because you're in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. All right, verse 5. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tri tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now today, no one knows among the Jews which tribe they're from. But God knows. Every Jewish person on the face of this earth, God knows which tribe he is from. Isn't that thrilling? God's kept all the records in heaven, which is marvellous. And it's 144,000 of them. These are not all in Israel. These are scattered right round the world. Do you know why the Jews are scattered today? Ready for the evangelistic push of the tribulation. And these people in Argentina, in China, in Mongolia, in Tibet, in um, Thailand, in Ceylon, there are Jews just ready. They speak the lingo absolutely perfectly. They love the customs absolutely wonderfully, and they're really part of the nation now, you see. Of course, while keeping themselves distinctly Jewish. But they understand the way their nation thinks. And God has prepared them ready for this push. They're all over the place. If the population of the earth, when Jesus comes again, is 5,000 million, right? This means that we have one servant of God in the tribulation for every 35,000 people, you see? And that's the task that they have. They have to preach the gospel to 35,000 people. In case you think that's an awful lot, they do get some help, but I'll be dealing with that in just a minute, all right? And that will be very good. All right, now here you've got the tribes. But there's something fascinating when you look into these tribes. If you read it carefully, there are two names missing in these tribes. Now, this is absolutely fascinating. The first name is Ephraim, and the second name is Dan. These are missing. 
Now, in the Bible, the Old and New Testament, there are about 18 lists of the tribes of Israel. And every one of those lists only contains 12 names. Now, in fact, of course, there were more than 12 tribes of Israel. Do you all know that? There were actually 13 tribes of Israel. Now, to get this clear, let me just show you how they're made up. Right? And then we'll understand. It's all based on Jacob and his sons. You had Jacob. He was a very fertile lad. Right? And he had... 12 sons, right? 12 sons. And one of them, who was called Joseph, came into what we call the double portion. He was allowed to have double of what everyone else had. And Joseph had two sons, who were called Manasseh and Ephraim. And the result of that was that the tribes of Israel, or the tribes of Jacob, were 11 of his own sons, plus two grandsons, right? Joseph being replaced by the two grandsons. So there were 11 direct sons and two grandchildren, which makes a grand total of 13 tribes. And there are 13 tribes in Israel. But in all the lists, only 12 are named. Who was the one who was normally left out? Well, it was the tribe of Levi. Because, you see, Levi wasn't allowed to have any land. They weren't allowed to farm for themselves or anything. They were the priests of the land. And so all the tribes normally are listed except for the Levites. And they say, and the Levites are spread throughout the land. And most of the list, therefore, give 12 tribes and miss out Levi. But if you notice here, in this list, in verse 7, the tribe of Levi is in. Now, that's very interesting. And so we have to ask, okay, um, let's see who actually is missing. Well, it's interesting. I've said Ephraim and Dan. Let's take Ephraim, first of all. In verse 6, right at the end, of the, 12, of the tribe of Manasseh were 12,000 sealed. So Manasseh is mentioned, right? But then, down in verse 8, you have something interesting. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. And instead of Ephraim being mentioned, Ephraim's father Joseph is mentioned. This is for a specific purpose, and it is this. Okay, the specific purpose, and it is this. That Ephraim, as well as Dan were guilty of leading the children of Israel into idolatry. They were idolatrous. It was part of their old sin nature to be idolatrous. And because Ephraim always had done this to the nation of Israel, he's likely to try and do it again in the tribulation. And as a result of that, God won't name him, but instead he names his father Joseph. But where you read Joseph, really he means Ephraim. So that's a minor problem. The omission of Dan is a much bigger problem. Because, you see, Dan isn't mentioned in any form at all in this particular passage. And so we have to ask ourselves, now why is it that Dan is totally omitted? What an odd tribe to miss out. And to understand that, we have to go back to Genesis and chapter 49. So turn with me to this most fantastic of chapters. If you want a really good Bible study, you try and study Genesis 49. It's so interesting. Genesis 49, verse 16 and 17, where we have the tribe of Dan mentioned. All right, now let's have a look at this, and this is very interesting indeed. Dan. His name means, by the way, basically judge, or he shall judge. All right? Let's read verse 16 and verse 17 and verse 18. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now, a judge was a, a man who was over the land and who reigned in the land. Verse 17 then says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way. The way was the sort of path that riders used to take. There's a horse. Right, with the rider on it like this. And Dan will be a serpent in the way. And the rider's riding along and everything seems clear, but there's an adder waiting. 
down there. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way, an adder in the past, that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backwards. In other words, any progress that's being made is brought to an absolute halt. The horse goes over, the rider's thrown off, and he's left stranded. It's a period of disaster. And then verse 18, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. In other words, Lord, you have got to save us from this situation. All right, now that is a bit of prophecy. So we have to ask, verse, in verse 16, it says Dan shall judge his people. Did he judge the people? Well, only once. There was only one judge who was from the tribe of Dan, and that man was a man called Samson. Samson judged the people, and for 20 years he judged them, and he was a good judge, even though he had a funny personality. He was a very, very good judge, and a few hang-ups. He was a very, very good judge indeed, and he delivered the Jews from the Philistines. So can you see that although Samson judged, he was not a serpent in the way. He didn't cause Israel to stumble over backwards and to fall. And so we have to say, ah, well, when was verse 17 then fulfilled? When is a man from Dan going to judge and going to cause Israel to fall? The answer is nothing in history up to this moment in any way fulfills this verse. Rather interesting. So what does that mean for us? Then it must be fulfilled in the period of the tribulation. This is interesting. All right, let me just tell you this, by the way. All the tribes of Israel had a flag or sort of banner, and every tribe used to carry this banner in front of them, a bit like the Olympic Games, you know, with every country marching round. Dan's flag always had a snake on it. It was the symbol of Dan taken from this passage. At some point in history, they couldn't bear being the snake, so someone changed it to an eagle, you know, the eagle who kills the snake. But actually, because this passage has not yet been fulfilled, they're still a snake. They really are, even though we don't know where they are. You know, they're still a snake, and they're still going to do Israel damage. All right, this must therefore be a period future. That is the period of the tribulation. And the interesting thing is, there is a passage in Jeremiah that sounds very much as if it could be a fulfillment of this in the tribulation. Turn with me to Jeremiah 8. Jeremiah 8, and verse 15 to 17. Jeremiah 8, 15 to 17. All right, now this is what it says. Jeremiah 8, 15, 16, 17. We looked for peace. But no good came. It sounds a bit like the beginning of the tribulation, doesn't it? When the Jews make an alliance with Antichrist. We looked for peace. We thought it was coming. But no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. Isn't that interesting? The enemy's horses and Dan here are connected. The snorting of his horses are heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. Sounds a bit like Antichrist's invasion of Israel. For behold, says the Lord, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed and they shall bite you. And here the enemies are snakes that refuse to be charmed and snakes that are allowed the full reign. You see? Ah, it is because of the passage in Genesis 49 and this passage that many Bible scholars indeed think that some character in the tribulation is actually a Jewish man from the tribe of Dan. Some think it's Antichrist himself. Remember Antichrist is a world figure, right? He's from Italy. But they also think that he could, on the basis of these passages, be a Jewish man. If this is the case, we're looking for a Jewish man of sort of Kissinger status. You know, Kissinger, I think, was a Polish Jew, wasn't he? Or East European Jew, anyway. So it's certainly not Kissinger. But we're looking for a, a Kissinger-like figure who will be Jewish and from the tribe of Dan, except there's no way to prove he's from the tribe of Dan. And if that is the case, it does explain an interesting passage which we'll deal with next week in Daniel. Turn on to Daniel 11 and verse 37. Daniel 11 and verse 37. 
11 verse 37, where it's talking about Antichrist, the ruler of the revived Roman Empire. And in verse 37, it makes this statement about him, which is very interesting. Neither shall Antichrist regard the God of his fathers. He'll reject the God of his fathers. And the next one is interesting, nor the desire of women. Now what does this mean? In the, in the Jewish culture, the desire of every woman was to bring forth the Messiah. And the Messiah was called the desire of women. And in other words, he will ignore the Messiah completely. He'll put Jesus Christ absolutely on one side, he won't even consider him. And so it looks from that passage too as if Antichrist may be Jewish. If he's not, then this person who is from the tribe of Dan is probably the leader of Israel who actually makes the agreement with Antichrist. You know, he looks good. He looks as if he's judging Israel well. He's ruling them for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Then all of a sudden, what happens? Israel falls and Israel has stumbled and Antichrist has marched in. Well, it could be either of those. As with much prophecy, until we get on top of the event, sometimes it's hard uh, to discern which is which. So there we are. So there are both sides to that. And let's watch and let's see if, if a man doesn't rise that we can actually identify. Let me just tell you this, by the way, and it's so lovely. Dan isn't mentioned in Revelation 7. But do you know, there is one list. We won't turn to it tonight. There's one list of tribes given for the millennium when Jesus has returned. And do you know who's top of the list? Dan is. Now, isn't that grace? Right? It's found in Ezekiel 48, for those of you who want to actually read it. Typical of God, you know, the one who isn't mentioned in time of trouble, he exalts to the top in uh, the time of great blessing. Absolutely thrilling. All right. Incidentally, if a Jehovah's Witnesses, Witness knocks on your door, you just turn to this passage and say, if it's spiritual, how come Dan's missing? And most of them don't realize that Dan is. And then you can give it to them. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, then Re back to Revelation 7. All right, so here they are. These are the witnesses that God raises up. Now, the situation is this. The moment the church is, is taken from the earth, these Jews suddenly realize that Jesus is their Savior. There are Jews on the earth today who recognize Jesus as their Messiah, but haven't received him as their Savior. Jews who refuse to be called Christians. They're actually here now. Isn't that fascinating? These are people who are looking to the second coming of Jesus rather than looking to his first coming when their sins were taken on the cross. Fascinating. And it may be of these Jews, uh, that of these Jews, the 144,000 will come. The moment the church is removed, it is such a stunning sign to them that suddenly they turn to Christ as their saviour. And they realise then that that Jesus Christ is indeed the saviour of the whole world. And they take everything on board, you know, they get the full understanding of the Bible. God anoints them instantly and they start witnessing and preaching the gospel. And you know, they have tremendous effect as well. In verse 9, we see some of their converts, right? Just have a look at this. After this I beheld and lo, a great number, which no man could number, of all Gentiles, the word nations, is the word Gentiles. Of all nations or Gentiles and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might. Isn't that lovely? If we could only get a chorus with all that in, we'll really have a humdinger of a chorus. Be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders, who's one of the leading angels up there, answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? He turns to John, he says, Who are they? John looks at him, gives the only answer that you could possibly give. Verse 14, I said unto him, Sir, you know, right? In other words, you, you better tell me who they are. He said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation 
and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Absolutely wonderful. All right, here they are. Of the converts, there is no assurance of deliverance at the end of the tribulation. It's only the 144,000 who have the assurance of getting right through the tribulation. There will be the most dreadful persecution. There will be the most utter horror upon any person who is a Jew and any person who is a believer during these days, you see. But God is going to raise them up. And it's only seven years, hallelujah. And they're going to know fantastic anointing upon their ministry. By the way, verse 16 of Revelation 7 is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. And in, when you get a situation like that, it's lovely because if you go back to that passage that it's quoted from, you have a passage that gives you more information. And if we turn back to Isaiah 49, which is where it's from, it's Isaiah 49 verse 10, actually. But if we turn back to Isaiah 49, beginning verse 8, we see a description of those who were witness in the tribulation. Isaiah 49, verse 8, and it's a lovely verse, a lovely few verses, and we'll just read it through. Isaiah 49 and verse 8. Right, I'll clean the board when I have time. And here it is. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. And I will preserve thee, right? And I will give thee for a covenant of the people to establish, or the word is restore, the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. In other words, they're going to be fugitives. They'll feed as they're traveling, right, on the path. And their, their pastures will be in all the hillsides. They're going to hide away from the enemy. Here they are. They shall not hunger nor thirst. He's going to look after them. Neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. In other words, they're going to see the way of escape. God's going to protect them. There's going to be miracles as far as these people are concerned. Wonderful. And now God is capable of doing it. And this is lovely, verse 12. Behold, these shall come from far. Lo, these from the north, some from Russia, and all the lands up there, and from the west, from America, right, from Brazil, from Britain, uh, and these from the land of Sinim, which is the land of China. There is the mention of China. Sinim is China. Absolutely. They, we t talk about the Sino-Indian pact, don't we? That's where the word uh, comes from. Sinim. Here it is. Now, can you see... You've got 144,000 witnesses, therefore, and you've got their converts, their preaching. Okay, last time, as I've said already, we see two other men who are preaching. That's Moses and Elijah in the land of Israel. Can you see, just here then, we have three major evangelistic pushes in the tribulation. First, the 144,000 preach. And that's a major evangelistic push. Secondly, their converts preach. And that's a major evangelistic push. And three, Moses and Elijah preach. There they are. And if that isn't enough, we also have a fourth in the tribulation. There's a fourth evangelistic push. Where's it found? Why, in the book of Revelation again. And let's turn then on seven chapters to Revelation chapter 14 and let's see this evangelistic push, the fourth one. I'm going to read verse 1 to 5 because here at the second advent of Jesus Christ, the second advent of Jesus Christ, we see the 144,000 with Jesus. Remember, chapter 14 here is an infill passage, right? One that gives us details. And I looked, verse 1, and lo, a lamb stood on, the Mount, on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written 
on their foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn the song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Beloved, don't try and learn that song. You'll never do it. You're not the 144,000. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Now that's just 144,000. But in verse 6 you've got the fourth evangelistic push. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And his message is in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And angels will preach in the areas where men cannot get to. Wherever God sees people who are hungry for the gospel, he will make sure they hear the gospel. It's true today, by the way. Some people are worried about the Hottentot, you know. Who preaches to the Hottentot, they say? Who preaches to the Eskimo? If man doesn't preach to them, then angels will preach to them. They will have every opportunity to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Very definitely so. And here, the fourth evangelistic push in the tribulation is an angelic one. God is going to give the people of the earth a time of amazing grace during the tribulation. A time when they can hear the good news. Now this is wonderful. All right? There is the plan of evangelism as is given in the Bible. By the way, don't let some person come along and say something like this to you. Well, it says in my Bible that there are going to be saints in the tribulation. And the word saints refers to the church of Jesus Christ. So the church is going through the tribulation. You hear that sometimes. Well, I've got news for you. And it's very good news for you. All believers at any time have been called saints. You will find, read it for yourself. Just read Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2. She talks about Old Testament believers as saints. Marvellous. You read it in Psalms, you read it in Chronicles, read it in Proverbs. All Old Testament believers are called saints. The believers in the church are called saints. The believers in the tribulation, they're called saints. The believers in the millennium, they're called saints. Why? Because any person who believes and is a follower of the true God, they are set apart for his purpose. And the word saint means holy one or one set apart unto God. All right? Praise the Lord. So you can immediately answer that and say, well, the word saint is not used exclusively of the church. It's used of any believer. I think we ought to end for tonight just in the Gospel of Matthew. And let's go to Matthew 10, first of all. Matthew 10. And see if we have time then for the second, ver second one. <coughs> Matthew chapter 10, and I'm beginning verse 16. Now remember, please, the Bible we have before us is all the church needs, but it's also all those who live in the tribulation. And there are parts of this Bible which have direct reference to people in the tribulation. We've seen that in Matthew 24. All right. By the way, you can see this. If you go to Matthew 10 verse 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus is talking to the twelve disciples, and look what he says. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that was given to the disciples. It does not apply to us in the church, otherwise we'd only be preaching to the Jew, you see. No. And we've got to understand which passages refer to which period of time. Now, of course, all the Bible is relevant for the Christian and we can benefit by studying it, obviously. But, you know, verse 16 to verse 23 has special relevance in the tribulation. Look at this and imagine those witnesses reading this in the tribulation. Look, behold, 
I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And you imagine all the converts as well reading this and being encouraged in this. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, they will scourge you in their synagogues, ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it will be given you in that same hour for what ye shall, spe- uh, what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And isn't that lovely? They have the seal of Father on their head, the name of Father written on their head. He's going to speak within them. We can claim this, of course, but they can claim it too. And then it talks about the tribulation that they go through. But look at this, verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye unto another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. That's the most wonderful, thrilling verse for them. Today the gospel has been preached in every city of Israel. Every one. But in the, that tribulation period, the time is so short, the land is so troubled, they won't have time to get round all the cities before Jesus has come again. That's going to send them on their way with rejoicing in their hearts. And also the verse above, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end, he that manages to get through to the end of the tribulation, shall be saved. In other words, I will come and deliver him. And he says, don't assume you're all going to die. You're not all going to die. But those that get right through to the end, I will come personally and I will deliver them from the wrath that is on the earth. Hallelujah. They'll be really encouraged at that time. All right. And let me just end in Matthew 28. And we may as well have a bit of controversy here and I'll leave it to your thinking. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. And this is rather interesting. Let's just read it. Jesus gave teaching for the church and also for the tribulation. I wonder which part of his message this was. It's not naturally, not obviously for the church. It's not obviously for the tribulation. But let's have a look as we read it through. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And the word nation is the word Gentiles. Go and teach all Gentiles, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them or discipling them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And this, and lo, I am with you always unto the end of the world, which is literally the consummation of the age. And what's a consummation? I am with you until everything comes to its climax. And then I'm coming again, says Jesus. Well, it could be that this passage is in the instruction given to believers in the tribulation. After all, it's rather interesting, isn't it, that the church in the book of Acts never baptized using these form- this formula. They always baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus or into Christ Jesus. It's very interesting at this point. Why? Because our whole faith depends upon the fact that we are part and members of the body of Christ. In the tribulation, it is not true. Once the body of Christ has been removed at the rapture, these believers are the same as the Old Testament believers. They are not members of the body of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it could be, could be, that in verse 19, we have the baptismal formula used in the tribulation. You pay your money, you take your choice, but I'm going to leave it on that very controversial note to give you all something to chew over. Next time, we're going to talk about the run-up to Armageddon. God bless you all. Amen.